Hey everyone, in this video we're going to talk about solving trigonometric equations and we're going to start with this example. In this example we are asked to solve when is sine of theta equal to one half. Whenever we are asked to solve an equation it is implied that we are trying to find all the solutions to our equations. Right when we were solving our quadratic or cubic equations earlier we saw that we would sometimes find two or three unique solutions. The same story is going to be true when we're trying to solve our trigonometric equations. We want to find every single solution out there. And one thing that's going to be a little bit different for our trig equations than we saw before is our trigonometric equations are often going to have infinitely many solutions, right? This comes from the periodic nature of these functions and the fact that they repeat themselves over and over and over. So in order to solve a basic sine equation or any trig equation, we're going to have to have some way of describing or listing all those infinitely many solutions. In practice, we may not actually need all the infinitely many solutions that are out there. We just might need some smaller subset of them, but from our list, we should be able to find the desired values. All right, so there's a couple ways we can go about solving this sine equation using our interpretations of the sine function. And we have a couple interpretations for us at the moment. That first one being like right triangle trigonometry. That's not gonna be too useful for us here. The other two being the unit circle definition or interpretation, as well as just the graph of sine as its own function in the xy plane graphical interpretation. All right, so on the board, I have a rough sketch of our unit circle and a sketch of a couple periods of our sine function. And so when we're trying to solve this equation, when is sine of theta equal to one half, we can interpret this in a couple different ways depending on which image we are working with. On the unit circle, our sine function is equivalent to some points uh, y coordinate. So remember, as we're moving along our unit circle, we're thinking about moving along an arc length given by our angle theta or some central angle theta that is equivalent to that arc length. So another way to interpret this equation is where are all the angles or arc lengths on the unit circle such that they land us at a terminal point that has a y coordinate of one half. And so if we think about where on our unit circle do we have a y coordinate of one half, we can see there's two points on our unit circle that correspond to having a y value of one half. The first one is over at the point square root of three over two one half in the first quadrant. Then we have one in the second quadrant as well at negative square root of three over two and one half. And so from our knowledge of the unit circle, we know that one of those angles or arc lengths corresponding to these needed points is at pi over six. And the other one is at five pi over six. So two solutions to our sine equation can be found by thinking of our unit circle and identifying those special points. So we kind of found these first two solutions using our knowledge of the unit circle. And we can also interpret this for our graph of our sine function over here. And it has a very similar interpretation. When is the output of our sine function equal to one half? Well, that will occur whenever our horizontal line at y equals one half intersects the graph of our sine function. And with this representation, I think it's easier to see that we are in fact gonna have these infinitely many solutions due to the periodic and repetitive nature of our sine function. We also can get that from our unit circle picture and interpretation. We just have to remember that, well, we can travel around the unit circle as many times as we want in either direction, use these co-terminal angles or arc lengths to get our other solutions. And so if we go back to the picture of our sine graph over here, that first solution is gonna to correspond to pi over six. And our second solution over here is gonna be the one corresponding to five pi over six. So how do we get these next two solutions over here further to the right from the graph of our sine function? Well, these next two solutions are just gonna be one period away from those first two solutions that we found. So we can just add an additional period length to each of these x values or theta values, depending on the variable we are using. And by adding that period to these original uh, solutions, we'll obtain the next set of solutions. If we subtract that period away, or in this case, subtract two pi away from those first two solutions, we'll get even more solutions, but to the left of our original two. All right, so I'll go ahead and show you a common way to list out all these infinitely many solutions. So let me go ahead and write that notation on the board doing this, and then I'll explain how this notation works if you have not seen it before. All right, so here's a way we can use set or set builder notation to describe our infinitely many solutions to our basic sine equation when sine of theta is equal to one half. And so the real important part of this notation are these little equations for theta, but let me go ahead and explain the entirety of the notation. 
So these curly brackets at the beginning and end of our statement here are indicating the beginning and end of our set. So we can kind of interpret this as this is the start of our set. The next thing that follows in the set builder notation are what the members or elements of your set are going to look like. So this is the set of theta values. And now we just have that context of thetas, you know, usually associated with an angle. So we're looking at a set of angles or arc lengths here. This vertical bar is always interpreted as uh, such that or read as such that. And what this vertical bar is separating is what the elements of our set or things that are allowed in kind of look like or are described by. And what's on the right of that vertical bar are the conditions these things have to meet in order to actually be allowed in our set. So theta is going to be some number such that theta is described by these equations. So we are looking at the set of angles theta such that theta is equal to pi over 6 plus 2n pi or theta is equal to 5 pi over 6 plus 2n pi. And this last little bit is kind of important. It's describing what this n is. This is our way of saying n is an element of the set of integers. This little lowercase epsilon symbol is used in set notation to indicate that this thing is an element of this other thing. So n is an element of this capital blackboard z is the common notation used to indicate the set of integers. I think it comes from the German word uh, Zollen or Zalen for counting or numbers or something like that. But basically, we just have to be aware that this formula is only going to work when n is an integer or a whole number. And so remember, where is this formula coming from? It's coming from the graphs of our sine function and the unit circle. So pi over 6 and 5 pi over 6 are these first solutions that we get in the first period on the graph of our function or around our unit circle. And by adding these different multiples of 2 pi to these uh, initial values, we're either taking an additional trip around our unit circle or traveling to the next period, either left or right, uh, depending on whether n is positive or negative. And so the idea is this short little statement, this like little two or one line set of equations, is actually describing all the infinitely many solutions inside our solution set. And so the way we could recover the other solutions from our uh, description here is by plugging in varying values of n. So if n is equal to 0, then we get that theta, according to our formula, is either pi over 6 or 5 pi over 6. If n is equal to 1, then we have to do a little arithmetic. Plug in n equals 1, then we get pi over 6 plus 2 pi or pi over 6 plus 12 pi. That'll give us theta is equal to 13 pi over 6 for our second version of that first solution. And we do the same thing to get the second version of our second solution. We have to add 2 pi to 5 pi over 6, and that should give us 17 pi over 6. And we can repeat this process for as long as we want or until we get as many or the desired solutions that we are looking for. So let's just do a few more. So if n is equal to 2, we go back into our formula, plug in n equals 2, and now we're adding 4 pi to our original uh, solution or 2 pi to our second version of our original solution. If we add 4 pi to pi over 6 or 2 pi to 13 pi over 6, we'll get another version of that first solution. Let's see if we do that. We're going to get 25 pi over 6. And we can repeat this for our second initial solution. So the first time around, we got 5 pi over 6. We added 2 pi to it to get 17 pi over 6. That corresponded to plugging n equals 1 into our formula. Now we can add 4 pi to it which corresponds to plugging in n equals 2 into our formula up here. And that will give us 29 pi over 6. So listing them out is useful when we're searching for specific uh, solution values, like maybe we're looking for all the solutions to sine of theta in the interval from 0 to 2 pi or from 2 pi to 4 pi. Describing them all will include those solutions, but if we want to find those particular ones, we just have to kind of plug in some n values until we get the ones we are looking for. Also, one thing I wanted to point out, our last little example here is n can be any integer, including those negative ones. And that's how we get these solutions kind of over here or to the left of those initial solutions. So if we plug in n equals negative 1, that's the same thing as just subtracting 2 pi from our initial solutions. So pi over 6 minus 2 pi will give us another alternative version or coterminal angle to that first solution. That'll be negative 11 pi over 6. 
And we could have also taken that other solution, 5 pi over 6, and subtracted 2 pi from that. And unless I screwed up my arithmetic, that should give us negative 7 pi over 6. All right, so we've seen our first example of finding all these solutions to a basic sine equation. And from this first example, I want to talk about generalizing this process to make it work for any of these basic sine equations, which will really be helpful for us when we're working with these uh, values that are not on our unit circle. All right, so in general, if we want to solve a basic sine equation, and by basic I mean we've manipulated or it was written in the form of sine of just theta is equal to a constant number a, then all these solutions are going to be listed by this particular set. That is the set of theta values such that theta is equal to sine inverse of a plus 2n pi, or theta is equal to pi minus sine inverse of a plus 2n pi, where n is just a, an integer or a whole number. All right, so when we solved our first basic sine equation over here, we used our unit circle and the knowledge of the graph of our sine function to find these two solutions, pi over 6 or 5 pi over 6. But when I write up the more general solution, notice I'm using our sine inverse or arc sine function instead. So the first part of the solution set I think should be pretty straightforward and makes sense just using our knowledge of inverse functions. Right? If we're trying to solve an equation like sine of theta is equal to 1 half or sine of theta is equal to a, just by using the inverse function or taking sine inverse of each side, That's what I'm doing right here. I'm taking sine inverse of each side of our basic starting equation. When composed should cancel out. Whenever we compose a function with its inverse, this is what will happen. And that will give us just our input or our angle theta is equal to sine inverse of A. So that is how we always get that first solution. That's where pi over 6 would come from, from our unit circle or from our arc sine or sine inverse function. So sine inverse of 1 half would give us the value of pi over 6. And then we have to use our knowledge of our unit circle or our sine function to uh, recover the second solution because sine inverse would not give us that second solution. So really we have to use symmetry here. Sine is always corresponding to a y coordinate on our unit circle. So if this is our arc length or angle theta here, by symmetry, the other point on our unit circle with that same y coordinate or that same sine value would just be reflected across the y-axis. So if this was our angle theta here corresponding to this point, reflecting our point across the y-axis will get us to our other point with that same sine or uh, y value. Through geometry, this reflection is going to preserve this little orange arc length that I'm highlighting in. That is our arc length theta. And so now we can see from this picture, if we want to get to our first solution or our first angle, we just travel that arc length of theta coming from sine inverse of our value or sine inverse of one half in this particular example. And if we want to get to our second angle, we have to travel that same arc length of theta, but not from our starting point. Remember, whenever we're describing these angles or arc lengths, we always think about starting at that initial point on our unit circle. So this isn't the theta value we really are interested in. We have to talk about our theta value measured from the starting point. And so that may seem a bit tricky, but that's really where this pi minus sine inverse of a part is coming from in our general description of the entire solution set. Remember, halfway around our unit circle is an arc length of pi. So to go halfway around, we have to travel this arc length of pi, but then we have to go backwards this arc length to land at the spot we really want. And by going backwards, that arc length is how we get that pi minus sine inverse of a piece. So the big takeaway from this is if we want to solve a basic general sine equation, our solutions are always going to look like this. We always get the first one from sine inverse. We always get the second one from pi minus our first solution. Then to obtain the rest of our solution set, we just add integer multiples of the period of the function to those first two solutions. All right, so we have successfully solved our sine equation. We've listed or described all these solutions to sine of theta equals one half. And we've also found a general process for these basic sine equations. Remember, for this general solution set, we're always going to find the first solution by taking sine inverse of our a value. In this example, that would be sine inverse of 1 half. Our second solution will then always come from pi minus our first solution. So pi minus sine inverse of 1 half or pi minus 
pi over six. That obtains our second solution. And then we can obtain all the infinitely many other solutions from these other periods of our function just by adding multiples of the period, or in this case, two pi to those first few solutions.